Hi everyone, my name is David. I'm a philosopher, economist, I consult leaders, teams, organizations. I lecture business ethics and I lead myself and others as best as I can do. Today, I want to share with you the power of story making for you and your leadership. And this is my story for you. I grew up as a Montessori kid. All the way from kindergarten to primary school, I was raised with Maria Montessori's mantra, help me do it myself. I always loved it, and it is still my working ethos today as a consultant and as a leader. I also grew up as a kid of two psychotherapists, my parents. So naturally, I was asked many questions at the kitchen table about myself, about others, always trying to fi figure out what's really going on, always interested in my story. How does that make you feel? Why did you react that way? And what do you really mean by that? What a great training in self-reflection, quite early in my life. It has led me to questions like, who am I? And what's the sense in all of that? However, I'm very thankful to have undergone such practice. Today, I like to think of myself as a sense maker. I love to discover patterns, hidden structures, arrange systems. I like logic and analytics as much as emotions, feelings and relationships. All that might sound a little self-centered, but rest assured, given a little sympathy, I'm deeply interested in who you are, in your story. I mean, who doesn't love a good story, right? Excitement, happy endings, tragedies or dismay. It can be the greatest entertainment that there is. Stories are told everywhere around the world. The mentor of both my parents coined the term, humans are storytelling beings. And the remarkable Joseph Campbell found out that there's even a common pattern in all the stories told around the world across cultures and time. It's called the hero's journey, and it's a pretty cool blueprint that you can find in ancient sagas and in modern Hollywood blockbusters. Now, I don't want to talk about the power of storytelling. This story has been told enough. I think it is the act of story creating that is much more important than to tell it. This is a power and a responsibility we have for ourselves, and as leaders, we also have it for others. For some reasons, I will explain. Reason one, creating stories is what makes us human. There are many things we can do better than our friends from the animal kingdom. We are born to run longer and faster under crazy circumstances because we can sweat better than any other animal. We have a super cool pincer grip between index finger and thumb, which gives us great dexterity, especially since we're walking upright with two hands free. But what makes us really special is our ability to be creative and communicate about it. With our amazing language skills, we are the only species on this planet that can use fiction. That allows us to think in scenarios, come up with plans, create religions, philosophies, and of course, stories. We are the only ones who can also communicate through time. We create wisdom and share it over their narrations. And this ability is our evolutionary turbo boost compared to all other animals. I call this the evolution of evolution because it detached us from a rather slow DNA-based route of trial and error. We have, path, have entered a path of ever accelerating evolutionary cycles of wisdom and performance. For example, we are not the only species that uses tools. But our tools have evolved like no others because we could create manuals, pass them, and improve them. 
And yes, there are still some stupid manuals today, I do agree. The most powerful tool that we have is fire. We cook our food with it, we use it to create metals, chemicals and other tools. We could transform the fire to use it to set free incredible resources of energy from fossil fuels. So you can't say, first we carried the fire and now the fire carries us. And as the story from Prometheus tells, we have stolen the fire even from the gods themselves. Our whole economic evolution is so crazy that it brought us forth as a species. We have selected systems that are not better but fitter to the uh, uh, circumstances around us of scarcity and of potential. We cooperate, we organize, we produce, we build, we trade and move like no other. What's the fastest way to get from A to B to C to D? Foot, horse, car, plane, rocket? Well, with the right story, like John F. Kennedy's narrative of putting a man to the moon, Sky is obviously not the limit. Our culture itself is evolutionary. For Daniel Dennett, it is the evolution of our culture that differentiates us most from other species. Beautifully explained in his book, From Bacteria to Bach and Back. The idea is we have our collective memories under constant natural selections. Our ideas under the pressure for survival, and our stories have an inert drive to replicate. This brings us from here, the very first cave paintings, or graffiti saying, I was here, dating 30,000 years back, to here, beautiful art in the Sistine Chapel only 500 years ago. And it takes us from here to here. I think one of the smartest things that we did as a species was to evolutionize our language and our ways to communicate themselves. We have created such a vast variety of languages, smartly adapted to all kinds of social and geographical environments. We've even created a universal language so simple that machines could learn it. And I don't mean English, I mean binary code. Today's binary language has its root in the Chinese book I Ching, the book of changes, how suitable, and is now the foundation for every digital language you can find. This simple mechanism of on-off allows us to transmit content with brilliant new means. Like the Morse code, invented in the early 19th century, led to the first real-time distributed mass communication the telegraph. Hindsight also called the Victorian Internet. And, in evolutionary terms, rather soon, a few decades later, the real Internet showed up, leading to an explosion of creative media content. YouTube alone is estimated to create 10% of all digital data traffic on the Internet. So, bottom line one. To lead people to their true potential, we must cherish their variety and bravery of original story creation and use our brilliant technologies to speed up their evolution because that makes us more human than anything else. Reason two. When you ask first graders in school if they are artists, all children will raise their hand. It is what they did all their life, being creative. Handcraft, imaginative play, inventing characters, their fantasy is pretty much endless. For a kid, four sticks can form a bonfire, a castle and a family, something I was recently told by my two-year-old son. When you ask fifth graders the same questions, only two to three hands go up on average. What has happened? I argue that they have been listening to too many stories which were simply not theirs. They have been taught what's really real and what's not, how they are supposed to function at school, and that there are more important things than playing and daydreaming. The same continues in college and university, especially with bachelor and master's studies. Like, oh, you want to be a philosopher? So 
Here is the exact prescription of lectures, the stories of the academic world, that you need to hear. And in most of our jobs, it's getting even worse. You get a precise job description for the role you're supposed to play. And then you even sign it to be bound to it legally. And what's not in the contract will be told to you explicitly or implicitly, at best by a nice corporate culture. At its worst, you end up with corporate propaganda, which, according to Ed Schein, grandfather of organizational psychology, doesn't fall short from brainwashing in North Korean prisoners of war camps. So, who has ever asked you what is your personal fantasy within this organization? Your very hopes and dreams. And I don't mean this half-hearted, where do you see yourself in five years, Mr. Roman, at a stupid assessment center, or yearly target negotiations. To bring some light into that rather gloomy picture, we as humans have an inert drive to create, to share, and connect. And nothing creates more true engagement than the feeling that I, with my story, can really contribute to an even greater story of everyone around me. There are heaps of data from Gallup and other researchers pointing exactly that out. So, bottom line number two. As leaders, it is our responsibility not to degenerate others to reactive story consumers. Let's facilitate the creation of our shared stories altogether. I mean, imagine the power of a collective vision or strategy with everyone being a genuine part of it. Reason three. What you think you become. This quote attributed to Buddha leads, in my opinion, to the strongest reason why our capacity of story-making has such a power and comes with such responsibility, too. At this point, I have to tell you, I have to admit, I'm a big supporter of social constructivism. Well, some philosopher colleagues would now probably say, what? No, how could he? And some others might say, uh, social, what was he saying? So, in a tiny nutshell, social constructivism deals with the question, is there an objective reality independent of my subjective perceptions? Or, in less fancy words, is the world discovered or is it invented? And I clearly choose the red pill. I think we make it all up. We are the inventors of our world. And I don't even argue whether there exists a reality outside of us. I'm just saying we're unable to find out about it because everything, like everything we experience through our individual senses and our thinking to make sense of it all. If you wake up in heaven and you firmly believe you are in hell, where are you? Where are you? And that way, the stories you create are not just stories. They define who you are. Are you a superhero or a villain, a winner or a loser? Again, the stories you create define who you are. Now, don't say at all that this is easy. I don't tell myself the story of how amazing I am at night and next day in the morning I'm the sexiest man alive with a Nobel Prize. It doesn't work that way. There's no miracle shortcut, at least not for me. What does work is this simple yet intriguing path of think, feel, act, have. My thinking, my sense-making of the world with my values and my attributes is the reference system to my feelings. Like, do I think that eating animals is fine or not will create a very, very different feeling towards the steak on my plate? And then my feelings will strongly guide my actions consciously or subconsciously. 
And eventually, I will end up with a result or an achievement. And whether they big successes or great failures is again dependent on my thinking. Et voilà, the circle is closed. It is this path of constant reflection of who I am and who I want to be, of questioning my thinking and carefully crafting my story about me and the world. This is a great power to shape my life, and it comes with great responsibility. Like William Hanley has beautifully put it in his poem, I am the captain of my soul, and of course, I am the master of my fate. This is not only nice prose, first weak signals from science are showing up in that direction. It seems there's, for example, some backing from the latest findings in quantum physics. Dean Radin, a Princeton University researcher, found out that through our intended thinking, our brain waves, we could have a measurable impact on particles on the quantum level. For some, this is scientific heresy, and for others, it is the dawn of a new understanding of the connection between consciousness and physics. Joe Dispenza goes so far that we are able to alter our quantum field, saying that if you are not defined by a vision or story of your future, you are trapped by the memories of your past. Now, I don't know whether this is true or not. What I know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And also, because this has been practiced in sports, in business, in relationships, yeah, this visualizing your goals, expressing your successes, and verbalizing your desired state of the future. These are all pretty well-known techniques to encourage you to create a story to your liking. Bottom line three. We heavily influence our lives by the stories we create about us. What we think, we become. And as leaders, we can create an atmosphere of encouragement, a conducive environment to personal reflection and growth. Or in the spirit of Montessori, let's help our colleagues, our friends and kids to do it themselves, to create their story and make sense of their lives. Because it is one of the most human things we can do. Thank you.